And welcome back, everybody. We're really glad you're with us today. We're here and ready for session number two during our Water Matters Water Questions Conference. We just heard from Nancy Melton. If you missed that session, that's all right. We've recorded it, and uh, it'll be posted uh, later to the shoutlearning.org website. So do check that out. But we're delighted now to be joined by Ed Smith and Jennifer Seven, who join us from the National Zoological Park. And we're going to go amphibian today. Um, but before we do, I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone is comfortable with how to interact with us. We do have a number of new groups joining us as, as the time zones change around the world. And uh, it's important that everyone feel that they are part of our live online community today and knows how to interact. So on the left side of the screen, there is a chat box. As you've noticed, we welcome your comments and questions. We'll be looking towards them as we go along. Sometimes it's not possible to get to every single one. We do have a lot of people and a lot of classrooms joining us, but know that we're trying our best and uh, we'll be looking for them. So don't hesitate to drop in those questions and comments. Um, in fact, if you'd like to let us know a little bit about yourself now, you can even type uh, a little bit about you or your group or who's gathered with you on the left-hand side in the chat area. We would welcome that as well. And you may have noticed um, that we are closed captioning the events today. And uh, we hope that you find that useful. If for any reason you'd like to turn off the captioning, there is a menu on the lower right side of the slide area where I'm pointing with that red arrow. And you can change your captions to no captions uh, and toggle that on and off as needed. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at both Shout Learning and in uh, both locations. So uh, do check that out. And at the end, we'll be returning and telling you about some additional resources, including the Microsoft Partners and Learning Network and uh, resources from our friends at Taking It Global, both of whom are important sponsors of Shout Learning together with the Smithsonian. So thank you to all of them for making this possible. And we're going to go ahead now and uh, turn the floor back to Jennifer and Ed, who are going to lead us on our journey through the world of amphibians in particular, understand the importance of water to them and in turn to all of the rest of us. Ed and Jennifer, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Thanks Good for having here. us. Um, yeah, amphibians and water kind of go together. So if you like to play in water, amphibians are great. Um, in our experience, uh, Jennifer has done a lot of uh, work with uh, salamanders and other, uh, other amphibians in the wild and in captivity. And uh, my background is uh, a zooey one. So I come from a watery kind of existence on a regular workaday basis. We have a large collection of amphibians um, in our exhibit. And at the National Zoo, um, we do uh, a number of things that uh, involve amphibians as a topic. Of course, there's education. And we have conservation programs. We research the animals. And husbandry is a big part of doing this because we actually have animals that uh, are out of the wild for various reasons, either educational or conservation. The building that I work in is called Amazonia. It's one of the few zoo buildings that doesn't concentrate on an animal group in particular. It actually concentrates on a place of the world that's defined by water, the Amazon Basin. So wherever a drop of water falls on the northern part of South America, pictured here, um, and if it drains out up here at the uh, mouth of the river, then it's the Amazon Basin. It's about the size of the continent of the United States. It's a really large place. In the exhibit, we focus on the place by making water the primary theme. So it's the home to all sorts of things. It's a huge system, very, very different from other river systems in the world. It interacts so much with the land around it because there's regular periodic flooding. It's a rather flat place. And so the river extends out into the forest quite widely. And animals that are normally found in salt water can be found in the Amazon. A bunch of stingrays that used to travel up those rivers historically when the Andes rose up. Evidently got blocked, and what lives in the Amazon now is a variety of stingrays that uh, are all related, and all related to the ocean-going ones, except for a very significant feature. They can no longer live in salt water. They've adapted to a freshwater existence. Um, in keeping with the aquatic theme and with fishes as our kind of focus for biodiversity, we try to show people that uh, the world is full of different things, and the Amazon is particularly so. Uh, the water there really affects the way that uh, animals have evolved. And in some places, um, there are lakes, oxbow lakes, created by the meandering of the river. 
Those places are warm water with a lot of things dissolved in it. And that's one of those interesting properties about water. If you put more stuff into solution and you heat it up, it doesn't contain much oxygen. So in those oxygen poor places, some fish like this arapaima, a guy that can get to be about two meters long and weigh over 200 pounds, come up to the surface to breathe. Um, it's, a, it's a place of really dazzling variety. Um, many, many types of fishes are uh, important as food items for the people who live around there. Protein uh, from the river is a really important resource for them. So we give a little look at the, uh, at the Amazon ecosystem, not just underwater, but of course where the water falls down to the river over the plants. And it's really a rich variety of things. Plants, whole forests really, that are growing in the air as epiphytes. Uh, it's a water-rich spot. And of course, it makes a very good habitat for all sorts of animals. Um, our sloth is nearing her 50th birthday at the zoo. So I don't know what we'll bake. It'll have to be something green. <laughs> uh, so it's a place where people come in um, to investigate uh, a little bit of the tropics here in Washington, DC. Part of our exhibit focuses on amphibians. And um, amphibians certainly are a, a very good topic for an Amazonian exhibit because they bring the topic of water directly home in that these are animals that require water for their existence in a very specific way. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. To keep amphibians, uh, you have to be very concerned about what kind of water they're in. Uh, you want to create a good home for them. And uh, a good home requires of course settings that aesthetically look beautiful to us, but uh, really have some very essential aspects to the amphibians. Um, setups like these do make frogs, like that little guy that's hiding beneath those bromeliads over there, um, feel at home. And they require, though, us being very careful about how we treat the water that comes in. Amphibians are very water sensitive creatures. So we live in DC. We get our water from a regular municipal uh, source, like uh, most of us. And that's fine for us, but it contains some elements that aren't so good for the frogs. So those things have to be processed, and the water that we control that goes into these systems has to be of a very particular sort, free of any kind of pollutants and free of any of the chlorines and chloramines that we normally put into our system. So it requires recirculation systems. And the reason I uh, put in some of these pictures is to just give you an idea that um, although it's uh, nice to have frogs in, in captivity, it, it looks good, it requires quite a bit of stuff to do so. And dealing with the water is one of the biggest issues. This is a, a reverse osmosis machine that strips the water of any impurities and gives us what we need for the culturing of amphibians and, of course, our fish, too. So we mix um, the water that we, uh, that we process uh, with uh, water that has electrolytes, and then that provides a good home. In this case, some tadpoles of one of the endangered species of frogs that we keep. Quick question, Ed. Uh, in our last session, there was a question about um, how delicate some of these ecosystems are. By showing us all of this equipment that's required to um, healthily um, keep these animals in captivity alive and, and well, um, it, does that suggest that uh, that the that the ecosystem in which they flourish requires a very delicate balance? Uh, yeah, it, it, it really does. Um, water is a huge issue, and uh, we take it for granted when we take a walk out in the woods and we see uh, birds drinking and, and, and fish swimming and frogs chirping. Um, but we know that the quality of water really affects the abundance of these animals. Uh, so, um, so yeah, in captivity, it really has to be tightly controlled, and it does reflect. Um, I think it's a good learning tool by keeping these animals in these captive situations, it certainly does make us appreciate, you know, the phenomenal stability of a healthy ecosystem, and and how important that is for the animals that, that live there. Um, some of the species, like this uh, high altitude dwelling frog from Panama, um, are now unfortunately only found in captive situations. So we're particularly concerned that keeping them um, alive and healthy is something we're able to do over time. So whether the systems are small water processors or, or larger ones, it's, it's all about the same business. We, we're careful that uh, all of our plumbing and, uh, and everything else associated with it, even the way we drain our water out of the tanks, has to do with um, keeping, it, uh, keeping it clean and not contaminating one tank with another. 
We're also concerned about the diseases amphibians may carry and spread to other animals in the collection. So even the water that in, that's coming in is, is always kept separate, and the water going out is also separate one container from the next just to cut down on any possibilities for infection. Um, so it's really a, a pretty successful business um, and rewarding in being able to uh, keep some amphibian species going from generation to generation like this. Uh, but it does take resources and time. We do fish as well, of course. So the operation is one that requires us being sure that um, our water is uh, also processed there. We use carbon filtration and high pressure sand filters like you see here for our big aquariums. Um, and resources are also required when you're doing amphibians because amphibians don't care much for takeout food. They're kind of big on live prey items. And one of the things we concentrate on is making sure we have um, high quality food for them. So we actually raise our own crickets to the tune of uh, getting in thousands of adults a week and letting them hatch out into these very tiny pinhead crickets about 10 days after the eggs are laid. Um, and that's a daily business for us, taking care of crickets and their eggs and their hatchlings in order to provide food for these small frogs and their babies. Another aspect that uh, we do is uh, educational. And so uh, I've had the privilege for a number of years of taking people down to the Amazon to, uh, to take a look at the habitat down there. And, uh, and we concentrate a lot on water quality when we do that to let people know how the intersection of water and the environment make for such a rich biodiversity. And it is amazing when you're there, just the amount of living stuff, the amount of photosynthesis that goes on in any one day is, is pretty astounding. Uh, water is abundant. Of course, it's equatorial, so you have 12 hours of light every day. And the plant material that's produced just feeds a vast amount of insect life. It feeds an enormous diversity of amphibians. Um, there's black water areas, and I was talking about the arapaima, that air-breathing large fish from the Amazon. They come from these places where the flow has been slowed down <clears throat> because the river meanders and cuts off sections that become lakes. These beautiful, deep, black water, mirrored surface lakes are places that uh, have a quality of water that's very different from the main body of the river. And consequently, animals have adapted there that are different than in the main body, and thus the diversity of the place. Getting out in the forest also gives an appreciation for the variety of animals that are found in this huge drainage basin. Hoatzins are a rather curious looking member of the cuckoo family that feed on leaves of one of the Amazonian plants. And then we're able with getting out and really looking at these ecosystems up close to appreciate some of the details that you can't see by just driving along in a boat or flying over. Uh, this is one of the uh, largest colubrid snakes in the area, uh, an animal that preys on venomous reptiles and, and others. Really impressive part of that ecosystem, and uh, there are many impressive parts to the Amazonian ecosystem. Lots of bugs, their diversity in insects is fantastic. And all of that supports a, a really amazing amphibian population, too, with a huge variety of ways of making a living from being a sit-and-wait predator like this horned frog that has a, um, a head nearly as big as the rest of its body, um, a real job of the hut looking guy who is an ambush predator, to amazing animals that live 100 feet above in the trees and very rarely, if ever, make it to the ground because the water they rely on exists in tree holes. And it's seemingly endless. Um, the Amazon is a, is a great source of inspiration especially at night when you go out in the evening and listen to the cacophony of sounds. There is really a symphony of amphibian music going on um, every night in the Amazon. And then recently, on the research end of things we do, I had the opportunity to get out in the field with one of Jen's colleagues. And uh, Jessica Dykeman and I went to Peru this last December. And it was a team of four researchers. Our driver is the is the brilliant guy that looked like it came off of the movie Tron <laughs> just recently. Um, and we did an, a high-altitude study. There's, uh, there's Jess looking 
kind of Blues Brothers setup for, uh, for her photo. Um, the study involves looking at areas of land where a pipeline has gone through. And so one of the gas companies down there um, is interested in knowing what happens to the surrounding ecosystem during the building and after the construction of the pipeline. So our project involved looking at areas. Those are our homes for the time, little shipping containers. And the reason I took this picture is some of the frog conservation efforts that go on currently use these shipping containers as laboratories that are easy to transport one place to the next. So I thought it was rather coincidental that I was put into what I normally consider to be a frog holding room as a place to live, which is, of course, jammed up with our equipment as well. Oh, I see a question about poisonous frogs from the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's a good question. Frogs in general are poisonous. And there are very few frogs that live undefended. And, you know, amphibian defense, you just think of amphibians and one word that's probably fairly pejorative that comes to mind is slimy. Um, they don't have spines. They're not covered with a good suit of, suit of armor. And most of them are small enough that Certainly a cat can overtake one easily, and a dog. So not being able to get away all that well from a bigger predator, and certainly not having any mechanical defenses, amphibians have come up with an amazing array of bioactive compounds that puts any diner, potential eater of frogs, off. So even our frogs in the Pacific Northwest are suited with chemicals in their skin that they produce that are toxic, and the levels of toxins vary between species to species. Um, I just suggest that if you're out in the field and you get a bit hungry, that you look for something other than the frog for lunch. So, <laughs> you know, nothing dangerous. But In the photo that's up right now, uh, the cutover area is where the pipeline has gone through, and wherever the pipeline crosses a stream at a certain altitude in the level where we are here in southern Peru, um, in, the, in the state of Ayacucho, we're going to be looking at frog populations of a certain species. Uh, it's a very high dwelling, high, I mean, an altitude dwelling frog. And of course, here we are on the equator, um, but things are rather cool because we're up uh, approaching the tree line. This is one of our lowest sections. And there's one of the investigators, Wilson, great Peruvian guy, very good botanist and a real good amphibian guy, doing some measurements of the stream. And when we get out there to do these uh, things, we're looking at the stream as an entity as well as looking for frogs. So we're concerned about the qualities of the water, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, that kind of thing, flow, turbidity. Um, so we do a lot of time measuring the place that we're looking at. And then we spend a very set, specific amount of time looking for these amphibians. Um, and then once we found them, we take a look at them in detail. Um, pictures, weights, measurements. We also swab each of the amphibians to find out what diseases they may be carrying. We're looking for specifically a type of fungus that's affected amphibians throughout the world. And uh, the streams that these guys live in are very different than the streams around here. The, the soil is rather compact. Um, and it's compact because of these dense, dense, dense roots of these plants that grow. The forest now is below the level of your ankle, pretty much. You're way above tree line. This is at around 4,000 meters, not quite 15,000 feet. A very different environment for those of us who come from uh, lowland areas like Washington, D.C. Um, and it's a stunningly beautiful area. It looks rather like tundra in my mind, so I've referred to it as equatorial tundra. Puna is one of the names for these ecosystems. Um, and the streams here are cold. Um, you're, you're up quite high, even though you're on the equator and the solar radiation is intense. Um, it's still uh, potentially a very cool area. So the little strip of tape that runs along the stream is a measuring tape. We do 100 meters on one side and 100 meters on the other side of the pipeline. Oh. To take a look at the, the frog populations there. So uh, it, again, it's a great chance to get out and play in the water. And playing in the water produced these things, a rather curious looking animal called Telmatobius. And this is a, a little frog that recently left its tadpole stage and is now a very young adult. Um, and there's a rather job of the hut looking developing uh, froglet, just about ready to lose its tail in that amphibian way that is so astounding. You know, to have a major limb structure like that reduce and reduce until it's absolutely gone would kind of be like waking up with one leg shorter than the next for weeks on end until they disappeared and incorporated the rest of your body. It's almost a magic trick. 
Thaumatobius as a, as a very young guy having lost its tail in a very atypical place. It's out of the water. That's not where they'd be happy. It's because these uh, strange investigators pulled that little guy out for a moment. And uh, the, the adults of this frog um, are, are rather impressive. Not a brightly colored frog, but a one perfectly um, matching its background of the stream it lives in. And of course, these guys are affected by many things. We found leeches on a number of them. It's a natural part of an ecosystem, um, but a significant one. So we measured the invertebrate populations of all the things we found in that habitat as well. When you say measured, you mean the, the quantity that you found? Yeah, the quantity. The quantity and the kinds. You know, what sorts of insects were we finding? What kinds of other invertebrates were we finding in the stream? Right. And um, it's, they're, they're, they're fascinating areas to me because the streams are so channeled that you see how this, the bank is rather steep, even though this is only a fairly small stream. Um, the, the photosynthetic product is just huge. And the roots are very firmly attached to the particles of soil. There's a rock underwater, um, and you can see some small insects on that, some stoneflies, and in profile, a little pipe sticking up. It's a caddisfly um, structure. There's some caddisfly larvae there. You don't get to see the larvae too well because they're rather cleverly encased in a suit of stone that they gather up and put on their bodies for protection. and some details of some of those organisms that we find there. So um, we were looking at a wide variety of, um, of animals from the stream with our focus being the frogs. This is a type of planaria that I'd never seen before. Well, there was plenty that I'd never seen before. Hmm. Uh, Telmatobius, where it doesn't like to be, and then heading back to home. So these are, these are frogs that don't leave the water. And we'll talk a little bit about what makes an amphibian an amphibian. Um, this is one of those amphibians that doesn't have the amphi part. The both sides to its existence are done in the water rather than one on land. So there's a Telmatobius quite at home. Uh, and it, a moment ago you said there was plenty that you'd never seen before. On these expeditions and research trips you take, do you go into these environments with the assumption you're going to be enlightened by new species, to, new to you that you haven't seen, or, or is this a rare thing? I if I have a chance to uh, to go out to one of our local parks um, and any day I leave my house, that's the assumption I take with me. Uh, yeah, I think seeing new things is really depending on how we're looking, not where we are. So, of course, when I'm into a, in, in a location that I haven't had the opportunity to be in before, yes, that's, of course, one of those little carrots that's out there driving you ahead. And, and to drive you ahead when you're in a location that's about three miles high and you live on the coast, um, you need the motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, but just getting out around here, uh, I, I don't think a, a week has gone by if I take a look at spiders and, and, and flies and, uh, that you don't find something new. Uh, Jen was pointing out something to me. Would you show me what well, you Questions found? have come in regarding how's the temperature of the Amazon changed with climate change, and has it affected the number of invertebrates? And mm -hmm. yeah, um, that's that is a good question. Um, it seems as though it's uh, it, it, it's a it, it's a pretty uh, certain business that the average temperature of the world is rising. So no matter where in you where you are in the world, that's true. How the temperature change of the water of the Amazon has affected any of the life there is a question I can't answer myself. Um, it's, it's a good one. The Amazon is a very, very self-buffered system. It's huge. And we don't have time to go into that too much today. But wow, that's a wonderful one to look at. You know, if you're curious about the Amazon as an ecosystem, there's, it's, it's really a phenomenal one. It's almost a little bit of a closed system, the loop being um, the amount of water that falls into that enormous basin. Um, uh, about half of it goes out, and the other half just kind of stays there recirculating. Not the same drop of water all the time, but a lot. And by the way, Ed uh, and Jennifer, uh, my colleague Adam has put up a question for us to all ponder for a moment. How many species of amphibians do you think there are out there? Go ahead and register your vote, and it looks like they're coming in. People, majority so far, say about 10,000. Would they be correct? That's interesting. There's actually about 7,000 amphibian species. And one of the things that Ed's going to talk a little bit later about is what's going on with the amphibian crisis around the world. There are a lot of species that are actually becoming extinct. 
at the same time that we have species becoming extinct, there are more and more people that are going out and surveying and um, looking for different species, and so we are discovering new species. So while the numbers of amphibians are increasing, we still need to be concerned because a lot of species that have been around for a very long time are actually going extinct or are threatened to be extinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, <clears throat> our finding new species isn't compensating for one's lost. It simply means that we're becoming aware of the resources that we have out there. And this is one of the driving forces behind basic research about going into habitats, even habitats we've looked at before, to look at again, to find out what species exist. <clears throat> in amphibians, we're finding new things every year. In fish, the same thing, even more so. And certainly when it comes <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to invertebrates, those numbers are ever increasing. Yet there are ever occurring extinctions. Um, it's, uh, it's very important for us to to be able to assess what we have. And, um, and I'm, I'm really pleased that people have such a, a rich imagination about amphibians. I'd love to see the, uh, <laughs> I want to go visit that planet where there's 100,000 kinds. <laughs> so the investigations include, as I said, playing in the water a lot. And uh, we try to document all the things we do. Uh, there's a lot of time, once the tadpoles and the frogs are collected from the stream, we note every location that we took them from and keep them in separate containers until we've looked at them and done our measurements and then put them back in the same place. So even in a little stream like that, uh, the one we're looking at, not a large body of water, there are very specific areas that these frogs occupy. They don't occupy each section of the stream. Some of the strong flow areas are less favored, and they like the quieter zones, especially one with an overhanging bank. So um, going through and doing the business of weighing and measuring and swabbing and photographing, uh, at times if we collected, say, 75 uh, individual animals at one site, it could take us about two hours to do. So that means two hours sitting out there in an area that can either be 30 degrees Celsius, you know, pretty warm when the sun's out, or as soon as the sun goes away, there's Victor shivering under a tarp. Um, Victor doesn't have a lot of body fat to spare. So when he started shivering, I was concerned <laughs> that, that uh, he should be doing jumping jacks instead of sitting finishing his recording work. Um, and uh, yeah, after the session, he was <laughs> we didn't have to drag him back to the car, but uh, he's a trooper. Um, it, uh, it, it almost took us a, a little while because everybody had to wait for Jess and I, since we're the landlubbers from down low. And uh, even walking 10 or 15 feet at about the three mile height we were at is enough to exhaust you for a moment and then you stand back and you appreciate the view. And it does give you a, a chance to, it's, it's a magnificent, the upper Andes are just a fantastic area. Um, like any of the mountains of the world, they're majestic. And uh, the life forms there, because you're below, you're above the tree line are, are very, very small things. So it's uh, the intricate looking, you know, really close looking pays off. We'd get to a site like this one, which is one of our highest altitude sites, and um, everything would be fine, be pretty warm. And clouds would roll in about a half hour later, and uh, and then you'd be covered in in hail. Uh, granizo is the word that's used there for these small balls, and of course you can imagine what that does to the quality of the water. It makes it colder, and um, and it changes the pH a little bit. These frogs are, are living in a very oxygen-rich environment, um, but it's entirely aquatic because the terrestrial system here changes from very, very hot one moment to below freezing the next. It's a dynamic ecosystem. Um, it was really fascinating uh, to be in a place like this. Um, I, I didn't have enough time to look for condors because we were playing in the water for the most part. Uh, but uh, this is one of those places where I'd encourage anyone to, to go and at least read a little bit more about. Uh, the Andes are so rich for human culture and so phenomenally rich for biodiversity. So finally, um, we need to uh, wrap our stuff up about the 
the research part and every homecoming when we'd get back every day because we'd be out in the field for 10 hours or so um, felt like reason for celebration and the whole business of having the opportunity to take a close look at your environment whether it's uh, out in your backyard or someplace you hadn't been before is for me just very very rewarding and really appreciate it the people I worked with were also great uh, very hard-working people uh, good detailed folks and uh, and an excellent attitude so we've talked a bit about uh, uh, frogs specifically and I just wanted to throw in a couple of pictures of some phenomenal amphibians. This is called a glass frog. I wonder why. This is a native salamander, close to, uh, close to Gen 7's heart, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, these are small animals, but they are magnificent animals. And it takes a little of our time and a little patience to reveal them. But it's one of those treasures that is, as far as I'm concerned, well worth finding. And well worth appreciating. You have a different feeling about your world when you know that it's as rich as it is, even when you walk past a moss-covered log. The potential for something like this that exists there is, is a good feeling. It's a group of frogs from the upper uh, Andes that, uh, and in some cases, a little bit lower elevation that have been greatly affected by a disease problem in the world. And this was just such a lovely shot of uh, Adelopis limosis that I wanted to put it in there. And then just the personalities, or you know, and these guys do have personality. That's what we find out by researching the behavior. They're not just a simple light switch on and off for any one trait. They have a wide suite of uh, responses to various stimuli, and they're just more amazing than anything you'll see in a movie. You know, Avatar might be fun, but right in your backyard lives something like this. So the amphibians, what are they? Uh, we've been using the word, and uh, that double life that. Uh, meaning that's built into the word just kind of reveals our, our, our linguistic heritage. Uh, English comes from Europe, and uh, Europe is a rather northern place with uh, a group of amphibians that does have a double life. Most of the frogs and toads there and the salamanders um, get up in the spring and head to a pond and have a big party, lots of eggs, lots of tadpoles, and then they go back to the land to live their existence there for the rest of the time. Tadpoles in water, adults on land. But that isn't a signature of the group itself. That's a phenomenon of some of them. So as English language spread through the world, and we ended up investigating the tropics, where the varieties of ways to make a living as an amphibian are far more varied than they are toward the poles, um, we found that our amphibian word was a little confusing. Not all amphibians live a life on land and water. Um, salamanders are one of the bigger groups of living amphibians. Frogs contain the greatest number of diversity. And then that odd guy off to the right, a Sicilian, are the least diverse in number, but fantastic in kind. We'll come back to that word a little bit later too, but Sicilians are uh, a wonderful animal that looks like an otherworldly thing. The business of water or land, as I said, doesn't apply to all frogs. Here's an African clawed frog, never leaves the water. Whole adult life is spent there, as of course are the tadpole stages. There are another group of frogs, many actually throughout the world, that never enter the water or don't need to. They live in moist places and their eggs um, go through a sort of development that uh, we refer to as direct development, uh, but they go through all the larval stages any other frog goes through, all within the egg. So what hatches from the egg is not a tadpole, but a fully formed small frog. Um, the Eleutherodactylid group of frogs from Central and South America are those. The frogs that we know more traditionally, like the toads on the bottom, having a springtime celebration of making eggs and potentially tadpoles, um, is the model that we're most familiar with. And the one that causes us a little bit of confusion when we stray from that model into thinking about the other two types, the all land or all water. All amphibians and their amphibian heritage is one that's based on their structure and their genetics, not how they make their living or where they make their living. Uh, another point of confusion for people, and it's easy to see why, is, um, well, here's something on the right that uh, is long-bodied with the tail, and it's kind of squirmy. It's got four legs, and the thing on the left is kind of long-bodied with the tail and kind of squirmy. The left is a salamander. The right is a lizard. 
one is a reptile and one is an amphibian, and the fall line, one of the places, lies in a rather clear distinction in the eggs. As vertebrates with amnions, like mammals, birds, and reptiles, our early development structure after fertilization includes wrapping ourselves in our own membranes. Amphibians don't do that. It's a very basic amphibian trait, and it's one that separates us well from reptiles. And if you flip over a log and you find an animal guarding some shelled eggs, that's a lizard with scales. If you flip over a log and you find an animal guarding some eggs that do not have shell, just a soft membrane, and you see a scaleless parent dutifully guarding, you found a salamander. Oh, that's, here's, a, here's a question I like, um, uh, a, a state referenced one. One of my first graders wants to know which state has the most kinds of frogs. Well, that's a good question. Um, what would you think it might be in that I've alluded to the great diversity of the Amazon and the relative paucity of types, the relative few kinds of amphibians found, say, in northern Europe, the south winds? And south and moist is a good combination. So my vote goes to Florida. I actually don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> well, Jen, did you? Uh, we, we've got some slides on, uh, on on a general business amphibians. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges facing amphibians today. Um, water is, of course, our theme here, and it's very applicable to amphibians. And we talked about. Even the amphibians that we said that don't use water for tadpoles, they need water continuously to stay alive, the way that all of us do. Water is a common theme for living things on the, on the planet Earth. For the amphibians, it's essential for their oxygen use. And of course, if they desiccate, if they dry out, they're gone. And they need to maintain their temperature balance and their osmotic pressure. Osmosis is a word we'll throw around a little bit. It's a good one to explore after the program as well. Reproduction for some species of amphibians, as we saw, for most, um, uh, takes place in the water. And uh, water is an essential, whether you're an ocean-dwelling creature or a creature on land or in a freshwater lake. Um, it's, it's, it's not just a nicety. It's something we must have. And we have to have it in the right amount within ourselves. Um, and it's a balancing act we're doing all the time. Uh, when we replenish our body's water, um, we do it in a certain way as mammals. Uh, when you're thirsty, you know what you do. It's cheers. It's taking a drink. And frogs, um, when they want to replenish their body's water, when a frog is thirsty, what do you think it might do? So I set up a couple of questions for you to think about and some choices. So we're going to go ahead and bring that poll up on the screen, and we're curious what you think a frog could do to quench its thirst. So look for that there on, on uh, right there on the top of your screen right now. Let's see what people are suggesting. And uh, I'll give people one more moment, although I will say that the early lead is going to all of the above. Let's go ahead and take a look in at the results as they come in here. Yeah, it it is interesting. It's 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 uh, of course drinking is uh, is we just associate that with thirst. When we're thirsty, we go take a drink of water. It's the best thing we can do. And uh, if a frog's thirsty, um, drinking doesn't really work. Um, frogs would uh, a thirsty frog sits in a puddle. Equally well, a thirsty frog could simply dig into some moist soil. This is why it's almost counterintuitive, but there are frogs that are found in the deserts of the world, in Africa and Australia. There are some amazing amphibians there. They maybe once every few years have access to an open pond, but they do have access to moist soil, and they absorb the water through their skin. So amphibian skin is a dynamic organ. Our skin is not so dynamic. Our skin is nice, but... Mm, doesn't do the same tricks that amphibian skin does. Amphibian skin is directly involved in their balance of water, their electrolytes, and their respiration. Our skin is a covering of dead tissue to keep the rest of our cells in our body nice and moist, keep us from drying out on the land. 
The balance of these nutrients that go across the skin's barrier has to be, um, has to be just right or the cells within the body can't function. So healthy amphibian skin, and this picture that uh, a, a mutual friend of, uh, of Jen's and mine, uh, Joe Milmo, took is just great. I love it. It really looks like a dynamic organ. It's a picture of a hellbender skin up close. And hellbenders live in cold water streams in the United States. They do a lot of respiration through there. So the, the skin um, does its job of uh, balancing out water and nutrients in the frog's body. One of the big challenges to amphibians around the world today is, uh, is a disease that seems to have traveled recently. And uh, it's a type of fungus called a chytrid. The top slide shows amphibian skin that's not ripe. It has a chytrid infection. The bottom slide shows healthy amphibian skin. Um, and what seems to be happening is an interference with the skin's ability to do water balance. And that can have severe effects. So around the world, unfortunately, we're seeing scenes like this, where in an environment that is otherwise undisturbed, and by that I mean we don't have any, it's not because a housing development went in, it's not because a plant showed up, a, some industrial plant, it's not because there were pollutants in the water necessarily. Um, this fungus can spread, affect amphibian skin, and cause die-offs um, just by its presence in an otherwise pristine habitat. So things to think about, um, I use that odd word, chytrid, it's just the name of this fungus. Um, osmosis is a word that has to do with the balance of nutrients and liquids across the barrier like our skin and is essential for frogs staying alive. Um, and uh, the barrier, uh, the cell's membrane or other tissue membranes, semi-permeable membrane, we talk about the selectivity that can go across those things. And, uh, this chytrid fungus interferes with that uh, very delicate, essential uh, process that we take for granted until there's a problem. Electrolytes are the thing the frog has a problem keeping in balance when the water um, is affected by uh, the way it can come in and out of the skin, chytrid affected. And sodium potassium pumps, always fun to look at those. And now on the internet, there's all kinds of interactive things you can do to learn a little bit about some of the dynamic functions of membranes. Um, I ran across this while looking at some papers on, uh, on chytrids recently, and I thought um, they were rather well-put sentences. Right. Jennifer does, uh, does her work greatly on uh, salamanders in our area, and, uh, and I thought she might want to talk about that for a little bit, too. Sure. Well, we don't have much time, but let me explain a little bit about what I do in the backyard of the Appalachian Mountains. So as Ed mentioned, amphibians live all over the world, and there are three different groups of amphibians. One of them is the salamanders, the caudates, or uridellas, that they weren't were called. And a lot of the ones that we have here actually don't have lungs, and they breathe through their skin, and they take in water through their skin. They're also completely terrestrial in many cases, especially the one that I study. Most importantly, we have a lot of species here in the United States that are endemic. Endemic means they're found here and nowhere else. And a lot of people still haven't studied them, and they're also being threatened. And amphibians all around the world are being threatened by a lot of different things, including the chytrid fungus that Ed mentioned, and acid rain, and chemicals, and UV radiation, and habitat destruction, and a variety of other things. And so we wanted to study what's going on in our backyard with an endangered salamander. And these are some of its friends and that has around the area. Um, these pictures are taken by Brian Gratwick, another one of our scientists. And this just shows you some of the diversity of amphibians that we have here in Virginia. And as you can tell, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and colors, and they're quite beautiful. One of the things that you may not know about is that we have endangered species right here, even in Shenandoah National Park. It's a protected area, but unfortunately, protected areas are also seeing amphibian declines. And I study the endangered Shenandoah salamander, and I have um, the fortunate 
ability to work with a number of agencies and organizations. I work with U.S. Geological Survey, the National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, among other groups, to study this amazing species. And one of the things that we're looking at, on the left you see a redback salamander, and on the right you see a Shenandoah salamander. And we're looking at whether or not the redback salamander is going to outcompete the Shenandoah salamander in the face of climate change. One of the problems with climate change is, and many of you probably have heard this, is that temperatures are increasing, and it also is going to bring changes in wet conditions. And as Ed mentioned, amphibians must have water. They may not need to live in the water. They can live on land very far away from water, but they still need the area to be moist at some points in time. And so when we're looking for amphibians, and this is a picture of me looking for the Shenandoah salamander, we lift up rocks and we lift up logs and we look underneath these objects because during the day, it's dry out and these animals are often nocturnal and so to see them you have to look under things and that's why when you're walking through the woods a lot of times you may not see salamanders but in reality in many places there are thousands upon thousands of salamanders that live underneath these objects and underneath the ground and so lifting up these objects and seeing what types of habitats they live in we're able to see if they need areas that are more moist or some can withstand drier conditions, if some are in areas where springs are coming up from under the ground, or a lot of the different properties of relative humidity and temperature. And in doing so, we have to look at climate and how it's going to change. And a lot of the models are looking at climate on big scales, but salamanders live in very small areas. They're not big animals, and so they can't wander around for miles um, to other mountains or to other areas, and so they live in just really refined areas of maybe a few rocks or within a five meter um, area. And so we're looking at collecting temperature and relative humidity on smaller scales so we can see how that changes. And really quickly, I'm going to run through just another study that we're doing. This is with Towson University um, and University of Virginia with the climate models, looking, bringing the salamanders into captivity where we can change the temperature and moisture levels to see how climate change would actually affect the salamanders and their competition and habitat use. And based on that, I also wanted to mention what you can do to help amphibians. And so Ed has mentioned that they need water, and some of them rely on water for breeding, where their eggs or their larval stage need water. And what you can do in your backyards or your school grounds is you can put in what we call vernal ponds or temporary ponds. And these are areas that don't have fish. A lot of times fish will eat the eggs or salamander um, larvae, hatchlings, or tadpoles. And so we keep fish out of these areas and animals can migrate to lay their eggs and juveniles can develop and then they can go into surrounding habitats from there. So to help with all the changes that we have from urban development and cities is to put some of these habitats back in place so that the animals can use them and breed. In another area, looking at the terrestrial side, we want to have plants, native plants, and habitat. So in the top right corner you see what's called a toad abode and that is basically a flower pot that's been flipped over. We want to keep areas for frogs and toads and salamanders to be able to hide under where the conditions are moist and they don't dry from the sun and they can escape from predators. So between planting of trees um, that helps with that and also prevents the trees and other things will help absorb chemicals and other pollution that may enter the stream. You also want to provide habitat for them to reside under. So there are quite a few things that you can do to help amphibians and there are a number of websites that we have posted here on some of the projects that the National Zoo and the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute are conducting and also some other organizations where you're able to go and 
uh, Frog Watch, for example, is a citizen science organization where you're able to learn different frog calls and go to areas and listen for frogs during breeding seasons call and report those. And this is done all over the country. There are programs that U.S. Geological Survey also does and a number of other organizations. And so just to end our session, because I believe the time is up, I just want to say how important amphibians really are to us. Um, they help, obviously, in a number of different ways. Not only are they cool animals that you can tell from these pictures, but they help control the insects and insect-borne diseases. They provide us with a lot of information for scientific research and medicines and surgeries and all kinds of things. And so think about an amphibian as something very important to our health and safety and also to the environment. And important to them is keeping the water clean and keeping it plentiful. I want to thank everyone, too. It's been great. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you for joining us. It's been wonderful, um, and thank you for, for sharing the story of so many amphibians uh, in, in a short amount of time. Uh, we are going to post the, the links. We have some requests for that. We'll, we'll post these uh, together with the recording. I uh, just want to sneak in one quick question. Uh, we had um, a question from uh, a group of students in Colorado who wanted to know, how far from water can uh, the frogs that you were talking about uh, wander. Uh, one particular student noticed he had frogs in his front yard from uh, from uh, rainwater. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, far, you know, it depends on the kind of amphibian. Uh, some really do go a long ways away from water, and then they remain in these places. Like um, Jen showed the picture of that flower pot overturned, or talked about hiding spots that are moist. Those can carry some amphibians through for months, if not years, depending on the kind of amphibian in their habitat. So sometimes it seems as though they're not so tightly related to the water, but for many of those species, it's essential at some point in their life in order to reproduce to have those pools temporary or not. And by the way, uh, Madeline had noticed that over the last 17 years in northeastern Pennsylvania, there had been what she perceived as a decline in the salamander population. Um, would she be correct in uh, thinking that that could be caused by development? And there are a lot of things that could be causing a decline. One of the things also is that the salamanders fluctuate in their population naturally. And so it's very hard in some cases to determine if it's a natural fluctuation or if it's being caused by human activity. And that's why long-term monitoring using scientific methods is very important um, to follow. But development certainly is. It, it interferes obviously with the natural climate and moisture that the amphibians are used to. Um, it prevents some amphibians that need to breed in water from actually migrating to those breeding places. Um, it impacts invasive species are introduced and impacts the amphibians in that way as well. So yes, development could play a large role in decreasing populations. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone for their great questions and for um, our both of our presenters for sharing very clearly their passion for what they study and for the world around us. Um, it's contagious. And, and I think if we end on one point, I think uh, we can return to Ed's notion that it's, it's not where you go, it's how you look wherever you are. If I, if I got that fairly close, I think that's one lesson I will take with me. And I think we can all do a lot better. I'll speak for myself. I'll look a lot less at my cell phone <laughs> when I leave here today and more at when Flip I Flip a log find. when you're out for a walk. Phone. When you're taking pictures, <laughs> aim it to the ground. And Maybe I'll find some amphibians under my will. cell phone. <laughs> right. Um, we will look forward to having you all join us for the next session. And in fact, our next presenter is sitting right here with us. It's uh, Douglas Herman uh, from uh, the National Museum of the American Indian. And he's going to talk to us and help us think about how indigenous people are perceiving and, and responding to water issues. It's going to be a fantastic session. Uh, Doug has presented in the Smithsonian Online Conference Series before, and he joins us for Shout today. So stay tuned. Before he goes, we do have a number, before before we take that break and before uh, Doug joins us, I did want to just remind those of you who are joining us for the first time today about a couple of important resources. Um, don't forget that this conference continues. Uh, we have uh, two more sessions today, three more tomorrow, and then we've got uh, conferences as well coming up uh, over the next few months. So uh, do check that out. Um, Ashley, a little while ago, mentioned uh, the badging project, and I wanted to mention that briefly for those of you joining us for the first time. Uh, we're very delighted that the Shout project um, now has the opportunity for all of you learners and uh, out there today to continue 
pursuing your interest and demonstrating your success at learning about topics like amphibians, uh, like the land issues we covered in our Lash Out conference, um, and earn digital badges, which not only help others know that you've developed an expertise around each of these topics, just like our Smithsonian presenters are demonstrating, uh, but that you also are sharing what you know with other people and bringing them into the fold of exploring the kinds of things you are all doing here. So uh, we'll put up in a follow-up, in our follow-up note, we'll include a link to the digital uh, badging sign-up page where uh, teachers who are with us today can sign up and get their students involved in this, of course, free online uh, learning quest uh, site and community. So we look forward to seeing you sign up for that. I'll leave that link up on the screen for a few minutes and we'll thank our partners, Microsoft Partners in Learning, Taking It Global, and of course the Smithsonian for bringing Shout to all of us. Stay right where you are and we'll be back in a few minutes with Doug Herman.